This episode of New Politics was released on the 16th of December, 2023, and produced on the lands of the Wangal and Wajuk people. Welcome to New Politics. In this episode, we look at the big issues that influence politics throughout the year, including the voice to parliament, housing and the cost of living issues, normalising our relationships with China, the leftover corruption issues from the previous government, the role of the mainstream media, and towards the end of the year, the war in Gaza. I'm Eddie Djokovic, editor of New Politics. I'm David Lewis, as you live and breathe. And if you'd like to support New Politics, you can support us through a Patreon subscription, but whether it's a subscription or whether you just want to listen in, read our material online or buy a t-shirt or buy a book, it's all available at newpolitics.com.au and all of this is a good way to support independent journalism. Our nation's road to reconciliation has often been hard going. The climb steep, the ground uncertain, the headwinds powerful, the way forward difficult to navigate. But through the decades, there have been moments of hard-won progress as well. That's why I say tonight is not the end of the road, and is certainly not the end of our efforts to bring people together. The issues we sought to address have not gone away, and neither have the people of goodwill and good heart who want to address them. And address them we will with hope in our heart, with faith in each other, with kindness towards each other, walking together in a spirit of unity and healing, walking together for a better future for the first Australians, whose generosity of spirit and resilience intensifies the privilege that all Australians have of sharing this continent with the oldest continuous culture on earth. The overarching theme throughout most of the year was the voice to parliament and it was a consistent issue that ran from soon after the Albanese government was elected in May 2022 up until the date of the referendum in October this year and in the end that was probably too long to run with this sort of campaign because each week it ran the support dropped and in the end it resulted in failure and it could have been so different but it wasn't to be. The Prime Minister expended a lot of political capital without getting anything in return. There were so many attacks on the voice of parliament as well and something that could have been so beneficial to indigenous australia just didn't end up happening it will be seen i think as one of the great referendum tragedies the referendum that really should have gone through other referenda losses were actually a positive thing such as the communist party referendum of 51 that 88 referendum was sad but not terrible. This is terrible. This brought out the worst in Australia. Almost the day after, the poll started saying that if that referendum was held the next day, most of the people who voted no would have voted yes. And that's something that no one really seems to have started to talk about and what that means. We have, but it hasn't really entered the public debate yet. We've seen how these campaigns chew up and spit people out, particularly the no campaign. A lot of very prominent no campaigners and now nobody's been relegated to obscurity because their usefulness is over. And Australia has a lot of healing to do. And we can blame probably nine years of the coalition bringing back a form of John Howard politics that encouraged people to be a little bit more racist while claiming they were being less racist. The whole no campaign, the official no campaign, was based on lies and racism. And that's the sad thing, that that this type of campaign would still be successful in Australia after a Morrison government shows that Australia still has a lot of growing up to do. On the voice to parliament, as we explained so many times throughout the year, it was quite a simple proposition and a simple constitutional change, but it was magnified out of all proportion. It was made out to be something that it was not, that people were going to lose their backyards, that there were going to be all of these compensation deals to be paid out to Indigenous land corporations. And there was probably too much emphasis on the voice to parliament throughout the year. And I don't know how you can downplay a constitutional change and argue the merits of it without making a fuss about it and then expecting people to vote for it. But the end result was that it was an open invitation for all the right-wingers, the conspiracy theorists, the political opportunists, 
It was a feral debate. It was febrile and toxic. And looking back, it's hard to know what kind of debate or strategy could have led to a different result. And we did argue that a short and sharp process towards the end of 2022 would have been much better than letting it go on for almost 18 months. And the slow drop in support for the Voice of Parliament also coincided with the slow drop in support for Anthony Albanese. But it was a textbook example of how not to run a campaign. And it was almost a repeat of the Republic referendum in 1999. And that set back the cause of the Australian Republic for decades. And that's probably going to be a similar outcome for Indigenous Australia as well. It's a long road, or at least a hard road to somewhere. We need politicians with the courage of their convictions to stand up and start slapping down right-wing lunacy. Not the right-wing, again, I, I do want to be clear, I'm all for variety of opinion. I'm all for people on the right having good and valid opinions. It's this disruptive, contradictory, base-level, anti-intellectual nut jobbery that I object to. Australia actually has a long tradition of intellectuals on the right contributing positively to public debate, passionately and argumentatively and, and all of that. But positively, why should this be in place? Why should that be in place? Now, I'm not saying I agreed with any or even all of it, but to look at an Alfred Deacon, to look at a a Menzies, to look at a a Haslock, to look at a Jim Killen, to look at people like Peter Coleman, Barry Humphreys, Leonie Kramer. Again, this is not to say that I agreed with much of what they said, but I could acknowledge that what they were saying had a validity and a a strength and an honesty to it in the way that the modern Liberal Party seems to not want to do. They'd rather have that Koch brother, Jacob Rees Mogg disruption rather than good, solid, firm, robust, passionate debate because they're none of those things. And it's a shame. The Housing Australia Future Fund, or HAF, is the government's $10 billion promise to build 30,000 new homes in its first five years. Today's extra $1 billion is on top of that and is the latest in the government's multi-billion dollar housing cash splash. Acknowledgement the crisis needs fixing. The minister says the solution is supply. Whether they're trying to buy a home, rent a home, or whether they have a mortgage is more supply of homes. An additional $1 billion that will be spent this year uh, directly on public and community housing. And earlier on in the year, housing became a big issue on so many different levels. Housing affordability in the cities and regional centres, costs to purchase, to rent, social housing, the Housing Future Fund. There were just so many issues floating around relating to housing at the time and that dissipated somewhat after the Australian Greens agreed to the Housing Australia Future Fund but it's still a big issue and likely to be a continuing issue for some time to come but we found out that there's so many different issues that contribute to housing affordability and all of them seem to be quite intractable. The rot was put in with the Hawke government plan of trying to help people buy more houses. It was then cemented by the Howard government with increases to uh, negative gearing and other tax rorts. It's now to the point where residential housing is seen as high return investment rather than somewhere to live. The housing crisis is going to be extremely difficult to fix. And it shouldn't be. There are all these vacant houses. Yeah, the Minns government in New South Wales is putting up taxes for vacant houses on foreign investors. Now, I think probably that's more of a headline-grabbing policy than something that will alleviate the problem much because there's not as much foreign investment as people like to claim. But at least it's a step in the right direction. They've got to really come up with some smart ideas and building more houses Building more unit blocks isn't going to fix it because there's plenty of stuff out there. They just need to open it up and then we can look at what needs to be built. Uh, We have to take developers out of the equation when we're thinking of this stuff. They skew it and that goes down to not allowing real estate developers on local councils or real estate agents or people involved with developers. I think it needs very sensible town planning policies written by actual town planners, not profiteers. I think it needs zoning law reform. Why are we building places in floodplains and fire corridors and on soil that doesn't really handle it? It's insane and we've got to fix it. 
And affordable housing did become a rallying point for the Australian Greens, and that was a campaign led by Max Chandler Matha. And there's a lot of political benefit for the Australian Greens from this. Renters are becoming a larger political group. There's more liberal-leaning voters who are renters, and there's also a younger part of the electorate who are renting for much longer or living at home for a much longer period of time. And this group will be attracted to the housing policies offered by the Australian Greens. But we also found out that there are so many different pressure points that relate to housing issues. There's so many different policy inputs from local councils, state and territory governments, and then the federal government. And you referred to some of those before, David. And it's just been a history of different political agendas and political opportunism, different housing grants that only make problems worse. And it's like this fine balancing act that when it does go wrong, it goes horribly wrong. And the Housing Australia Future Fund, that's only a small part of the solution. It could have been much bigger and it could have been a much better solution, but problems that have taken a long time to develop will also take a long time to resolve. And there are many solutions available, but most of them are politically unpalatable for governments. The market might end up naturally resolving some of these issues, but there have to be mechanisms put in place to alleviate the current crisis and then reduce the chances of it happening again in the future. And again, it's a failure of the free market. A free market, as the theorists would tell you, would have fixed this problem by adjusting rents to whatever the fair market rate was. But anyone renting out there will tell you that rents aren't fair at the moment. Rents aren't at sustainable level. I think if you're on the minimum wage, there's one suburb in Sydney that you might be able to live in. And I think the situation in Melbourne, there might be two suburbs. So you've got people in their 40s and 50s in share house situations living like 19-year-olds. That's not to judge you if you're in that position, of course. But I suspect there's a lot of people who don't want to be in that position and who not unreasonably thought that with the jobs they have, with the careers they've chosen, they should be able to afford somewhere to live. And that's absolutely reasonable and not unfair. Again, we've got to get the profiteers and the developers out of policy because what happens, we end up with private infrastructure, which is a disaster. Private roads are a disaster. Private rail is a disaster. Private airports is a disaster. All they seem to do is pour money into the pockets of people who do nothing and make it inconvenient for the users of these things. We've reached the end of the failed 40-year neoliberal experiment and the next government policies should be to expunge a lot of it, get rid of public funding of private schools, tax the churches, nationalise infrastructure again, nationalise the stuff that was privatised, make private health untenable. What's the point of having a hospital without emergency department? What's the point of having a hospital that can turn away patients that doesn't want to deal with? What's the point of having a school that you pay 40 times as much for to get the same curriculum taught by the same qualified people, that it's got better facilities, that the students don't get to use that much? It's been a failure. And the housing market is exactly why the market is not the solution to every economic problem. It's failed. It's failing. It's failed others. And other people are through no fault of their own being failed by it. So it's got to change and it's got to change as quickly as possible. The Greens have made suggestions. Not all of them have been practical and some of them seem to really just put the price of housing up further or at least prevent it from coming down. But if all parties can sit down, again, without the stench of developers and vested interests, and in fact, maybe in federal parliament, there should be a limit on how many properties you can own. One of the issues at slowing reform is that a lot of MPs have more than three properties. So obviously, they're not going to vote to pay more tax and to restrict property ownership, et cetera, et cetera. So maybe we should go as far as in a reversal of history, you're only allowed to own one place or maybe two if you, you might own one in Canberra and one in, in your electorate, but no more landlords in parliament. Could be wrong there. It could be being too hard, but these are the ideas that we have to canvas if we want to get proper and lasting and just reform. Australia, along with other countries in the region, has an interest in continued stable growth in the Chinese economy and its ongoing engagement with the world. And I believe that we can all benefit from the greater understanding that comes from high-level dialogue 
and people-to-people -people links, and that a strong relationship between our two countries will be beneficial into the future. Where differences arise, it's important that we have communication. From communication comes understanding. The relationship with China seems to be back on track with most of the sanctions and tariffs that were placed on Australian exporters during the time of the Morrison government have now been removed and that relationship with China seems to play out along political lines. Labor has a good relationship with the Chinese government. The Liberal Party is happy to trash the relationship for base political purposes. But the change in the relationship with China, I think this can only be a good thing for Australia. This process also started soon after the Albanese government came to office last year and it goes to show that a relationship can be so easily destroyed and so quickly destroyed but putting it back together takes a lot of time and a lot of skill and the government probably won't get too much credit for patching up the relationship with China but it was the right thing to do there's great benefits for both countries now that the relationship has more or less been sorted out. It was a triumph for the government to fix this after years and years of suspicion being ramped up against China, buffoons being Prime Minister and Foreign Affairs Minister, and basically just a not good feeling. We nearly lost the South Pacific. China jumped in when the Morrison government lost interest in being the responsible older partner or senior partner in the South Pacific with smaller nations. And that was a terrible thing. And we were able to get most of that back. I'm not sure we got all of it back. I don't think it'd be possible to get all of it back, although time will tell. Our relationship with India, which again is problematic, Modi being a controversial figure, he's very popular with Hindu Indian, extremely popular. Outside of there, not so much. And there's been domestic things that people have pointed out as perhaps Modi's not the best leader for India. Having said that, foreign affairs, it doesn't matter who the leader is. And in the long term, it's better for Australia to have a good relationship with India than not. And I think looking at it in long term, Australia will still have a good relationship. And that's a good thing, I think. I think that every international relationship is going to have its fluctuations. And of course. there's so many different political factors going on within all of those countries that you mention, and then there's the opinions of the international community as well. But it's foolish to trash any of these relationships unnecessarily. Morrison and Peter Dutton's commentary about reporting China to the World Health Organization to investigate the origins of COVID, I think they were quite foolish and reckless. It hurt the Australian economy, and I think ultimately it hurt the Liberal government at the time as well. They thought that they might get some political benefit out of it, but that just never happened. And the Prime Minister also had meetings with her President Xi Jinping and repairing relationships with other countries is really hard work but these meetings were quite productive with China. There were those recent incidents with Australian Navy ships in the East China Sea but this issue seemed to be more ramped up within the media than anything else but I think diplomatically Australia did have a good year. Yeah, I've said before it is nice to know that our foreign minister can go overseas and not make a fool of herself. Our prime minister can go overseas and not make a fool of himself. And we haven't had that for some time. Really, the last one was Malcolm Turnbull, but he wasn't in really long enough. Before then, it was Julia Gillard and Kevin Rudd. So we had a lot of time in there where we just put our hands over our eyes and try not to watch while the prime minister went over and basically damaged Australia just by turning up, which, which I guess is an achievement in itself. You're listening to New Politics. You can subscribe to us on Apple or Google Podcasts, listen through Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud and Amazon Music. Or you can find us at newpolitics.com.au and you can now support New Politics through Substack and Patreon.
And there were a few leftover issues from the previous government, all relating to corruption and mismanagement. The government did introduce the National Anti-Corruption Commission in the middle of the year, and this was in response to all the corruption that we saw in the final few years of the Morrison government. And it was something that was promised by Scott Morrison in 2018, but never came to fruition. It was also promised by Anthony Albanese for most of the previous term of parliament, and now we finally have it. So... That's now in place. And there was also the Robo Debt Royal Commission, which took up about half of the year. And that was probably one of the better Royal Commissions that we've ever seen. It was forensic, it was detailed, it examined all of the issues that resulted in one of the worst examples of maladministration in Australia's history. And it produced a report that was quite damning. And while it can never be guaranteed, we just hope that we never, ever see this kind of program ever again. We're still reeling in many ways from this, and it'll take us a little while to get over it. I think that it was ever thought to be a good idea. Not enough consequences happened yet. Everyone involved should not only lose their job, but should be tried, and I suspect, if found guilty, sent to prison for a serious amount of time. The politician should be sent to prison for long enough that they cannot ever stand in a federal or state seat again. Public servants should be sent such a way that they can never get a job with any Australian public service again. It was just awful. Too many people died as a result of it, and that number is, of course, one and greater. And it was ineffective. They, not only did they not get anywhere near what they were hoping to get back, they had to pay it all back anyway. So it was bad policy all around. The Royal Commission was an exercise in how to do a Royal Commission. I think the biggest issue from the Royal Commission was how on earth did such a hideous government program develop in the first place anyway? And how was it allowed to fester for so long? I think these are the big key points. But the other key point is that all it takes is a bizarre and ideologically out of control government to implement something like this. And it was an obscene abuse of power and there was nothing there in place to stop them. And the good thing is that governments will always be found out. And I think in this case, they were found out in a very comprehensive manner, but still the big point is that it should have never have been allowed to happen in the first place, and there's not much in place to stop it from happening again. And there was also the creation of the National Anti-Corruption Commission that we talked about before. We haven't heard anything from them yet, and that's probably the way that it should be. We don't want to hear a running commentary about what they're up to because that would defeat the purpose of it. We want to hear from them when they've got something to say. And we do know that there's at least 44 referrals to the Anti-Corruption Commission, and that's been operating for five months or thereabouts. They must have been doing some work during that time, or you'd hope so. But I wouldn't be surprised if we start hearing the results of some of those referrals sometime in 2024. A decent investigation takes time, and it should take time. Every claim has to be treated as seriously, and they know that some claims will be not serious for whatever reason. You don't want to make it a kangaroo court. You have to give those accused the presumption of innocence and prove them guilty. You have to be rigorous in this because if they are guilty, you want to make sure that they are guilty and make sure that everyone involved is also investigated and tried properly. It should be private, really. The trouble is is that some of these people may, may well and statistically will turn out to be innocent, but people tend not to remember the clearing. They just tend to remember the, the accusations. So I think I am hoping they are keeping quiet for these types of valid reasons. And I hope that when things are concluded, we don't get things like, oh, the file's closed for 40 years, that we get a full and public audit, if you like, of what happened, why this person was accused, how it was investigated, and why they were found guilty. We don't want show trials. We don't want closed courts. But we want to make sure that there is a due process that is thorough, that is fair, that is unimpeachable and done in such a way that people are scared of uh, doing the wrong thing.
So there were also a few big defamation cases throughout the year, and the earlier case was by Ben Robert Smith in his case against Nine Media, and that was comprehensively defeated in the law courts, and a lot of private and personal material was released that made Robert Smith look even worse than was previously realised, and there was also the defamation trial brought on by Bruce Lerman against Network 10, and similar situation, Lerman was made to look even worse than was previously suspected, if that was even possible, where a lot of personal and private material has been made public and the findings and decisions from that case will be made in 2024. But the message seems to be if you're an awful and famous or infamous person, don't bring on a defamation case because you're likely to lose the case and made to look worse than previously thought. And I hope that Senator Linda Reynolds has been watching this case because she's suing the ACT government for defamation as well. And I'd suggest that she calls it off because there's a lot of material that will be revealed that she might not want in the public spotlight. Already she's not come out well from the Lerman case. I think Shane Dowling suggested that she's been caught out on perjury in her testimony in, to the police and should be tried. Certainly, I really think Lerman's strategy was to get everyone to settle before it went to court. And then Channel 10 decided, no, the reputation of our program is too big. We want to fight this in court. And it went south very quickly for the Lerman team. It seems that less a case for defamation and more a case to maybe reopen the court case, which was never concluded, and actually bring it to trial to see then if he is indeed innocent as he claims, which is something I'm not sure that anyone wants at this point. And there has been some speculation that Senator Reynolds is also going to be funded by Kerry Stokes in her defamation case. And there is that West Australian connection there as well. But it just seems that these are high risk cases. And if it was anyone else, you'd think that they were just being frivolous and vexatious litigants. And it just seems that this is more of a case of media versus media rather than individuals. And there is a media circus behind all of these cases. And it just seems that defamation laws have been used for all the wrong reasons in these cases and it's hard to see these types of cases ending because when you've got media proprietors with deep pockets they can easily afford the 16 million dollars that was used to settle the ben robert smith case and that was just the beginning of that just so that they wouldn't have to reveal email exchanges it's almost like there's a series of proxy wars between these media proprietors and it's pretty much a waste of precious legal resources and a waste of the court's time Exactly. Yeah, I think there's a few issues going on. I think the culture wars, the need to crush the woke left and to diminish the crime of rape because boys will be boys and we're just emasculating our young men and Bruce is a fine young man who just happened to be in the wrong spot at the wrong time. None of which I believe, by the way. That's a part of it, which plays into the, the media narrative of political correctness has gone mad. I think you're right that there are little proxy wars between the big media owners. SBS is the only news service that hasn't been sued yet, and I'm sure they've got, they've got their lawyers ready to go. Although I suspect the deep, deep, deep pockets of the conglomerate who owns Channel 10 is going to discourage further legal action from the prosecution. And it seems, I think the evidence is, is out that it, it is seems to be Kerry Stokes who's funding the Lerman case, which the Ben Robert Smith case, I understand, because it was all to do with the Victoria Cross thing and the Christian Porter, because he was Western Australian liberal. The Lerman one is a little bit harder to understand, unless Lerman's telling the truth when he says he's got all this dirt on senior figures. I doubt he does, to be quite honest. I think the time is well past for him to thrown it out. And if he loses this case, he'll have no reputation that will hold any credibility anyway. So it's an odd choice for Stokes to make, if indeed it is Stokes, allegedly, etc. It does seem a very odd hill to send your troops out to die on. And there was also the ongoing role of the mainstream media throughout the year, which we pretty much critique every week. But they played a damaging role in the Voice to Parliament campaign. And They've also played a fairly one-sided role in the reporting on events in Gaza, although it's become a little bit more reasonable over the past few weeks. There were calls earlier on in the year by the Australian Greens for a Royal Commission into media ownership and specifically into the role of News Corporation. 
And those calls have lessened over the past few months, but this isn't an issue that is going to go away anytime soon. And media behaviour isn't going to improve of its own accord. And given that next year is the year before the next federal election, and there might even be an election next year in 2024, The federal government is unlikely to do anything much in this area, but it's an issue which does need to be sorted out. It will all depend on the political will. Can they be bothered bringing in the major reforms? There's a lot going to be happening over the next 12 months and it just may not happen. But I do hope they devote some time to it because things have to change for the better and soon. And it's also unclear about what's happening at the ABC. They've dropped the political panel show, The Drum, and that's supposedly because it wasn't rating well. But the ABC isn't about chasing ratings, or it's not meant to be. It's meant to be about providing quality programming, quality news and information. But that just seems to be a lost cause now. And generally, the mainstream media is chasing conservative audiences, the ones who are cashed up and still engaged with free-to-air television. And, And it seems that most of the political narratives that we see in the mainstream media are geared towards them. And we suggested that they've got a waning influence because they weren't very influential during the 2022 federal election or the 2022 Victoria election, but they were certainly an influence during the Voice to Parliament campaign during the year. And maybe it's a model that just can't change and might not change until all the people who were brought up on free-to-air television no longer exist. Murdoch, News Corporation, Sky News, they're still there. And there's still a cancerous influence on Australian politics. And that's probably an influence that will continue to be there until either News Corporation drops off or there's tighter media regulations. And there were some discussions about media reform, truth in political advertising regulations and legislation, maybe even a Royal Commission into the media diversity. But at the moment, all of these issues just seem to be a long, long way away. They're still very, very important, but resolving them just seems to be a long way off it's way 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 past time for media reform i think every major owner of the media in australia so news corp channel 9 and 7 west media needs their licenses reviewed and revoked i think i think the big behemoths have to be broken up and i'm still thinking my way through this but i'm pretty sure that the public ignores the media when it's not saying what it wants to hear and listens to it when it is saying what it wants to hear, which explains the loss of the Morrison government, which is a narrative the media just did not want to push at all, and the loss of the yes vote, which the media did push. So I I think that's a part of it. But it actually helps our case that nobody listens to the media. We When it agrees with our presuppositions and our preconceptions, we listen to it. If they don't agree with our presuppositions and preconceptions, we don't listen to it, which is problematic for a functioning democracy anyway. And that's an issue we'll get into at another point, I think. But it also means that the media is now just a tool used to reinforce our own biases. We begin with harrowing images and testimonies obtained by Al Jazeera from inside a school in northern Gaza following an Israeli attack. Bodies of a number of displaced Palestinians are seen piled up inside the Shadia Abu Ghazala school that's west of the Jabalia refugee camp. Witnesses say a number of people, including women, children and babies, were killed execution style by Israeli forces while they were sheltering inside the school. Witnesses say they did not find any evidence of shelling or missile attacks. The Israeli soldiers came in and opened fire on them. They took an old man. The Israeli soldiers stormed the school, took all the men, then entered classrooms and opened fire on a woman and all the children with her, even the newborn babies among them. She, her husband and her eight children together with her cousin. The Israeli soldiers executed those innocent families at point blank. The final part of the year was dominated by events in the Middle East where Hamas massacred around 1,200 people in Israeli communities and military bases in early October. And the Israel Defence Forces unleashed a war of terror against Palestinian people in Gaza and have killed over 18,000 people. 
And there have been calls from the international community for a ceasefire and to create a lasting peace in Gaza and the West Bank. And while there was a ceasefire for a short period a few weeks ago, the rocket attacks and bombings have kept on going. And the Australian government has changed its approach to Gaza. Several weeks ago, Australia abstained from a vote on an earlier ceasefire and just one of the few countries to abstain. And it also voted against a resolution calling for Israel forces to withdraw from the Golan Heights. But this time around, they've supported a ceasefire along with 152 other countries at the United Nations. So it's taken a while for Australia to turn around on this, but it's the right course of action. What happens in Gaza just cannot continue and it has to come to an end right now. Well, this is a black spot on Australian foreign affairs that they could even abstain from calls from a ceasefire, which they did a few weeks ago, to come in and now vote for it is a bit late. A Liberal, was it Birmingham, who said that ceasefire can't be one-sided? No, a ceasefire can't be one-sided. That's pretty much a given. It's got to go from both sides. I'm hoping that there are some decent people in the Israeli government who are going to remove Netanyahu, which will slow things down. And then, of course, Hamas needs to be removed or the current leadership of the Hamas needs to be removed and better people put in. Again, all of this is, I've said this every week, so I won't go through the reasoning again, but it's all to do with local politics that has nothing to do with stability, global peace. There's also that gas line that is currently in Palestinian waters and with a shortage of natural gas imminent, it's going to be very important. On oh, this has been a galvanising point for many in the Australian community and there have been many pro-Palestinian rallies and political action that's been taking place over consecutive weekends over the past six or seven weeks and that's something that rarely happens in Australia and it's not just happening here but in so many countries around the world but there has been a shift in thinking about Israel and what it's doing not just in Gaza but in the Middle East or its role in the Middle East and the destruction that has been going on there has just been so extreme but I think that Israel has been doing pretty much whatever it wants in Gaza and West Bank essentially since Yitzhak Rabin was assassinated by a right-wing extremist in 1995 but even before that as well but my feeling is that the tide is turning against Israel and I think Australia supporting this ceasefire is actually quite a big shift because Australia has always supported the US on its stance on Israel but this will put more pressure on the United States administration which will then lead to more pressure being put on Israel to stop what it's doing in Gaza and the West Bank so I think there has been that subtle shift, but I think it's going to shift quite dramatically quite soon. I saw a report this morning that Joe Biden is now starting to rethink America's support for Israel. Now, that's not going to mean that they're going to abandon Israel by any standard, but I think it may mean that America won't go in quite as enthusiastically as it was going to. They've brought in Australian ships to help in the gulf but i think the world doesn't want a war over this or a, a global conflict and it's possible and i'm not saying it'll happen but it is possible that things are going to start to de-escalate and hopefully consequences will go through i think joe biden too probably realizes that there's a prima facie case for him as a war criminal and so this may be part of it too This is New Politics, one of the top 10 Australian politics and news commentary audio programs. You can listen to us on Apple or Google Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, Amazon Music, and you can find us at newpolitics.com.au, and you can contribute and support New Politics on Substack and Patreon. So these were all the big issues throughout the year, but there's also the big issues that didn't rate so highly. And the reporting of COVID almost disappeared completely, and that's in more ways than one. It virtually disappeared from media reports, and 
The reporting of COVID cases almost disappeared as well. It went from daily reporting down to weekly reporting and now it's just once a month and it's just really difficult to find the case numbers. And we hear reports about how there's a new Omicron variant that's coming in time just for the Christmas break and there's officially 1,600 daily cases across Australia but there's likely to be a lot, lot more than that that are just not being reported. There's around 10 deaths each day from COVID and it's still listed as a pandemic according to the World Health Organisation but it's almost been forgotten about here. I guess uh, when it comes to this stuff, it's easy to forget and let it rip and worry about potential consequences when they happen. Some epidemiologists have said that it's a type of virus that will sleep in the system and do uh, long-term organ damage to every organ. I'm not an epidemiologist, so I can't really critique it except to say that that's within the realms of possibility. And passing it down to future generations rarely works. Certainly this negative stuff does. And it could be in 20 years the hospitals will be filled again with people with failing organs with a reignited COVID. Now, this is extreme, and I don't wish to say that this is definitely going to happen, and I don't want people to panic, etc. But I do think it's very irresponsible of governments not to keep a closer eye on it and a more obvious eye on it. And what worries me is that they're scared of the conspiracy theorists and the far-right nutters who are anti-vaccine and who were anti-lockdown and anti-Dan Andrews and anti, you know, pro-Gladys who closes Sydney down and hence the country, uh, but anti-Dan Andrews and anti-McGowan who actually did their very best to keep it from spreading. So I guess it's easier to ignore than it is to actually do anything active. And for the press, it's easier to ignore than to do anything positive or active about it too. So it will be remembered as one of the great lost opportunities. So much of the, the 2010s and the 2020s were just lost opportunities. And I wonder how far behind we've been put because of them. And the other big issue that didn't really rate very highly was the environment. And it was an issue that Anthony Albanese campaigned strongly on during the last election campaign. And although there was the release of the Murray-Darling revamp a few weeks ago, there just hasn't been very much on climate change. And, and this is at a time when the world recorded the highest average temperature ever. We've had a lot of unseasonal weather. Sydney is really sweltering at the moment with a massive heat wave, but just seems to be business as usual. And it is a bit different to the terrible bushfire season that we had in 2019-20, which effectively cost Scott Morrison his job. And the federal government has been pushing some issues at the margins with electric cars and river management, but we're yet to see the renewable energy superpower that Albanese kept on talking about during the last election campaign, and that's something that we could be looking at for next year, but there just isn't enough action on climate change at the moment. Yeah, it was so hot today, I saw Kate McClymont and Alan Jones sharing a fan. I know that they're saying it's just you get hot years, you get, but we're getting each year we're breaking the record for the hottest year on climate. And my favourite is when they say, oh, look at all this snow. Yes, it's called Newton's laws of thermodynamics. For every action, there's an opposite and equal reaction. So if it gets really hot, it's going to get really cold. Uh, it just gets hotter for longer and colder for a shorter time because that's the equal reaction. Again, we've, we've gone past where we can wait for anyone. We've got to start to regulate mining more. We've got to look at what are the profitable for Australia, for the country of Australia, mining, how do we do it sustainably? There are progressive voices calling for nuclear power. One of the issues is the length of time it takes to build. There are also, of course, conservative voices calling for nuclear power. And the waste still remains problematic. Plus, even if the risk is one in a million, is that too big a risk for a Chernobyl-style meltdown? Labor's in a great position at the moment. It's got friendly crossbenchers for the environment. It's got a friendly Senate for the environment. Now's the time to really march. I know they're doing a lot, and I know that Labor supporters out there are going to say, but they've got all this to fix. I know this, but... Apart from fixing the stuff of the past, there's a couple of vital things for the future that they have to start now or miss the boat. And the environment is probably the main one and maybe the only one. And there's also the other issues that have dropped off. Domestic violence also dropped off the agenda. There have been over 50 women who have been murdered in domestic violence situations by their partners. And that's a big issue that still needs a lot of 
work on and there's still the issue about gender pay equity and a wide range of issues that relate to sexual abuse, workplace harassment and, and just because these issues were issues that were paid lip service by the Morrison government and the Morrison government has now gone, it doesn't mean that these issues have also gone away. So hopefully these are the issues that the federal government will continue to address and highlight next year. And next week, we've got the final episode of New Politics for the year, and we'll be reviewing the performances of the Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, and the Leader of the Opposition, Peter Dutton. That's it for this episode of New Politics. Thanks for listening in. And if you'd like to support our style of journalism and commentary, please make a donation at our website at newpolitics.com.au. We don't beg, plead, beseech or gaslight you about journalism coming to an end. We just keep it very simple. If you like what we do, please send some support our way. It keeps our commitment to independent journalism ticking along. I'm Eddie Djokovic. Thanks for listening in and it's goodbye to our listeners. I'm David Lewis. We'll see you next time.